Yeah, I own five companies now. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Went from zero to 100 real quick. I did, I did. And, and I've, I've sold companies over the years, and it feels like I always come back to having like five on the roster. What is up, you absolute weapons? Welcome to the next episode. My name is Calvin Branson, and I'll be sitting down with entrepreneurs from all walks of life to talk about their successes, failures, and how to make an impact. This is none of your business. Firstly, thank you so much, Bunny, for coming on the None of Your Business podcast today. I really do appreciate it. It's uh, an honor to be here. Awesome. So for the listeners who don't know you, outside of your business, who are you? And give us a bit of your background. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a retired model and retired stunt woman, third generation entrepreneur. I grew up in Southern California as a surfer, like all the stereotypical Californian things I did. <laughs> and rode horses, lived in Ecuador for a year, lived in China for a year, and started my first company when I was 17. So that was almost 20 years ago. Wow, your first company when you were 17. That's insane. Yeah. What inspired that? Have you, I mean, oftentimes when, when people start companies or businesses or something like that so young, they're often surrounded by other entrepreneurs. Were you surrounded by entrepreneurs or? Uh, yeah, I grew up in business. I real and and it was it's funny until I don't know it probably took me about a decade to realize that I started my first company when I was 17. I remember my mom giving me that feedback cuz I went to university. I was bound and determined to not become an entrepreneur. Didn't want my own company. I had grown up in it. I had seen the sacrifices that my parents had made. I had seen, you know, the burden on my family that my grandfather's trucking company had had. And that's what I was focused on, Calvin. Like I wasn't focused on the freedoms that came with mm. it. And I wasn't focused on the experience that I got to have that other kids didn't get to have because their parents had an employer. Mm. And I, it's difficult kind of when you're growing up in it, in the aspect that you don't know any different. And so naturally for my family, if there was an expense that we wanted to invest in a vacation, a new car, anything like that, they had the means to turn things up in their business and be able to make that investment. And that's something that I witnessed. So while I was at university, I had a job, I was working at a gym, and I also had another job working um, for like a really well-known freight company. And I saw an opportunity to teach swim lessons and lifeguarding within just like our neighborhood because there were a ton of places, I went to school in Tucson, Arizona, there were a ton of homes that had pools and there were a ton of places that taught swimming, but there weren't people that were going to people's homes and teaching their kids how to swim in their pool. And so I saw that as an opportunity and really quickly I was able to turn that cash into a schedule booked full of clients. And then I was like, well, if I'm charging $60 for a lesson, I can pay somebody $20 while I'm going to school because school started to get in the way of mm. my income and my schedule. I only had a certain amount of hours between two jobs and going to school. So I started paying people 20 bucks and I'd take the 60 bucks and, you know, had a $40 profit. And that was just like second nature to me. And paying employment taxes and all of that was something that I could easily calculate and have an accountant do all of that. And so my mom's like, you know, this is a business. And I was like, no, it's just, it's like a, it's just income. It's just cash. It's just a side hustle. <laughs> and yeah. then, um, yeah, I already had the relationships and I already had the pools. And so I ended up starting to do lifeguarding, like for private parties and all of this kind of stuff, because it's like, Oh, that's even better. I just get to sit here and watch instead of actually teach somebody how to swim. And by the time we moved away, I had like 70 something um, people that I could call to do these lessons and do the lifeguarding. And I had a client list and it was great. And so I just ended up selling that to another swimming company that was local that didn't have that uh, option and wanted the client list and wanted the employee list. Yeah, that and, dip. <laughs> and I walked mm -hmm. away, not still not thinking that I had had my own company. Wow, that's crazy. So uh, m maybe I, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure here, but you, you obviously said that you didn't want to be an entrepreneur. You didn't want to have your own business. Was that because you saw the people around you and like 
the sacrifices they had to make to pursue that? Or what was the reason exactly? You might have touched on it, but just... I, I mean, I think it was just, like, we're going to be really honest. My mom never got to be at, uh, like, the class parties. And I perceived that that was because she had to work. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and just as a kid, I was like, oh, I just resented the company. And the reality is, is it was their company. And so I turned it on entrepreneurship. But she would have had even less freedom if she had a nine to five job. Like I played three sports until I left college. Um, Actually in college I played one sport, but so until I graduated high school and my mom never missed a practice or a game. That's insane. Like looking back at that. And what I was focused on as a kid is the fact that she had a cell phone at my practice and she was having to answer phone calls. And I remember she brought like The week before taxes was due, she brought um, all of the files and envelopes to Six Flags Magic Mountain and like sat in the car and did all of the organization so that my friends and I could go and do, you know, have a fun time at an amusement park. But I was like super resentful that, you know, there was this work and I was an only child. So the only thing I had to compete against was the company. And so I'd tell people that. You know, I had another brother that, you know, was my parents' favorite and it was their company and all this kind of snarky (laughs) stuff. And just, yeah, I built a whole lot of resentment in my head against it. And I think that that's natural for any kid whose parents work really hard. Um, And I took most of it out on my mom. And it wasn't until I was in university and I was seeing how it was working for other people that I realized like how flexible she had designed her company to be around my schedule and around me. And the fact that she literally hadn't missed a game, a tournament, a practice, like anything. It's very hard to see past your own, I don't know, your own difficulties when you're young When you're young, you know, it's like you only see the negative stuff. It's hard to see the positive. So I completely get that. But so, so, I mean, your relationship with entrepreneurship wasn't ideal in the beginning, but clearly it's, it's gotten better over time. So what is your business? What do you do today? Yeah, I own five companies now. (laughs) (laughs) Crazy. Um, Went from zero to 100 real quick. I did. Nice. I did. And and I've I've sold companies over the years and it feels like I always come back to having like five on the roster. Um and so it's a variety of different areas and it all focuses around optimizing the income and impact and helping people, helping entrepreneurs have a better relationship with their company, not be owned by their company, but the other way around. Um and we're also doing that in corporate too to figure out how to do more work-life alignment. I did go to school and get a master's degree as a therapist. And what's funny about that is that once I got done with school and I went to work for another like therapy practice, I was like, they suck at business. So (laughs) I went and like started my own private practice and, you know, had a sold out private practice pretty quickly because I knew business. It was just in my blood. And I'm getting calls from my classmates that are like, how did you do that? I'm like, it's simple. It's like business. And they're like, they didn't teach us that in school. So I started coaching them and I figured out I, I love being a therapist, but I really love helping people have a better relationship with their worth through their companies and help them build a legacy company that's not dependent on them. And that's how mm. I got into that. But it's just kind of funny that I've had the observation made that every time I went to work for somebody else, I'd end up working on the business and not like I couldn't just do my job. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But your system, your onboarding. I remember like getting hired at, um, I did some work for Child Protective Services and I was like, this is so inefficient. Like I couldn't go out into the field until I finished X amount of this training and I had to wait for the trainer to be available. And I was like, why, why aren't we, why haven't this been recorded or why isn't there some kind of a quiz to test my knowledge on this or, and I just realized that it's business is everything even in sales is everything. Like even as a parent now, I'm constantly selling my kids on the idea of going to bed or, 
eating yeah. fruits and vegetables over, you know, candy and cookies. And so I think any time that you can really look at how you can bring the most amount of value into this world, you're less frustrated. And so mm. rather than trying to put myself into a job description, I just created companies that would harness all of my gifts. Okay. So the main thing though is focusing on helping entrepreneurs maintain that balance, right? So I know you said you have yeah. multiple companies, but that's the main focus. If I'm Yeah. Not yeah. So okay. coaching and speaking yeah. on cool. building a business without burning out. That's the main thing that we do through a better place consulting. And then cool. I have a nonprofit and then three other companies. We have a tech platform for coaches that's called Coaches HQ. And uh, the nonprofit is a service dog education nonprofit. So we work with like airlines, oh, awesome. restaurants, um, hotels on how to interact with service animals. We don't train dogs, but <laughs> we train people yeah. how to interact with them. And then I have a private investment company that um, helps entrepreneurs get out of bad debt. And then we have a online co uh, community for uh, hybrid and work from home entrepreneurs. Crazy. You know, I have so many questions. Like, <laughs> I'm not even looking at my list right now. Um, first one off the top of my head is, how do you manage the, the time? Like, I'm sure you get asked that all the time, but like, I really do want to know because, you know, it's having all of those things going, just managing one company is like insane, you know? Yeah. And I'm sure, I'm sure you have a very like regimented, I don't know, game plan about how you go about it. But yeah, how do you do that? Yeah. Well, the key word there is managing and I don't manage. I am okay. really good at being the visionary and I hire people who are really good at doing management and leadership. Um, I set the vision and I own the companies and there's three ways to invest and it's time, energy and money. And a lot of entrepreneurs start out investing all three and they don't invest a whole lot of money. So because they don't perceive that they have it. And so they end up doing a lot of the management, a lot of the hat wearing and shuffling and all of that. Where I've gotten to in my life is that I prioritize my health and that's physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and then my family and then my companies. And so in order for me to have the time and freedom that I want at this point in my life, I've invested money and traded money in order to have other people do it better. And that that's really the truth of it is they do it better. Like I'm not a natural born manager. And so people are like, well, how do you run five companies? I don't, I don't run mm. five companies. I own them. And if you look at like, um, other investors, uh, who's the guy who owns Virgin airline? Oh, uh, Richard Branson. Yes. Yeah. So he has like 450 brands, I think. Mm -hmm. And nobody says like, oh, you run 450 companies. No, yeah, it's, yeah, it's very obvious. He's got a team. And so like, how can you trade your expertise to be able to add value in areas? Like you could probably own 10% of a company. I know tons of coaches out there that do coaching for equity. And... Yeah. Like that's where it's like, how can you trade your highest amount of value for the highest amount of return on investment? Yeah, you hear it all the time, right? It's like you can't do everything in the company. It, it wouldn't be possible. You know, you would, the company would probably fail. You think that you can do the marketing and the managing and the this and the that, but you really can't. So, yeah. okay, um, that makes a lot of sense. And so you started with your, the, the swimming and coaching business in the beginning, and it sounds like you had one or two uh, you know, employee kind of jobs along the way. How did you get into this specific, uh, you know, coaching businesses kind of um, job, uh, not job, company? Like what were the beginning yeah. stages? How did you actually get into it? Kicking and screaming is what I feel like, <laughs> in all honesty. Um, I, it took me a long time to like do it full time because I had this identity that I didn't want to be an entrepreneur and it's 
my mom will listen to this and laugh at me because she like just pointed out in so many areas. And then my accountant was like, you actually have to make a business now. This is too much for just like a sole proprietor. You're losing out on money and taxes. And that motivated me to actually make a business. But I was like, well, I'm still not an entrepreneur because I have this W-2. Um, and if you're listening, like in the States, there's this grid, there's this like matrix that you can look at where it's like, what, what's the amount of taxes that you pay being a employee versus being self-employed versus being a business owner versus being an investor. And the biggest thing that got me is like, as an employee, you're paying about 22% taxes. So essentially if you're working Monday through Friday, like you're paying the government two days of your work, mm. like a day and a half of your work. So you're working for free for a day and a half. And I was like, no, we're, we're not doing that. <laughs> and it didn't matter how well I did my job. Like I may get a raise, but that wasn't proportioned to the amount of value that I was adding. And since freedom and time freedom and financial independence is something I value, I wasn't using my resources in the best way possible for that. And so what ended up happening is I got stuck in a hurricane in the Dominican Republic for like <laughs> the weirdest situation. I was on a family vacation. I was still responding to emails. And at that time, I had partnered with somebody to do the coaching and consulting in our company. And then they actually hired me to come into their company and do the business development and operation stuff. And originally it was a consulting contract and they convinced me to come in for the benefits to be able to be an employee. And I was like, okay. And we, you know, presented it to the company that I was an employee. And I got a really nasty email from this person because I was in a hurricane and I didn't have power for four days. And like, I mean, it was incredible, the circumstances, and it was two things. One, it was that pushed me over. One was my husband said, this is the first time you've actually sat like with us, and we had just my laptop that had the charge. And he's like, this is the first time you've sat and watched a movie from start to finish with us that I can remember. Like, not getting wow. up, not going to do dishes, not going to check your email, probably because we were on my laptop, like, not checking your phone. He's like, this is the first time I can remember. And that really hit me. And then the second yeah, that's thing. Insane. Yeah. The second thing was like, when I did get the email back, there was like almost a dozen emails from my boss, who I saw more as a business partner, being really nasty about me not responding. And I was like, I, I mean, I had 100 emails from people that knew I was in the Dominican Republic asking if I was okay. Yeah. But I had this email, these emails that stuck out and was like, you don't really value me as a person. Yeah. You value the revenue that I'm bringing to your company. And yeah, the, the outputs of your work. Yeah. Yeah. And even then it's not, it's not fair and it's not proportional and I need to be able to get away um, with my family and not feel guilty about it. And that was work I don't blame that person for. That was work I needed to do. And I needed to break up with the external metric that my worth was dependent on how much I could do for somebody else and really find my worth. And in the process of finding my worth, I realized that working for somebody else wasn't the highest valuation of my worth and that all the things that I got feedback on on making being a great employee, the fact that I could get four hours of work done in 45 minutes and all of this kind of stuff, I really in that moment realized some misplaced loyalty And it was time to become loyal with myself again. And so somehow, some way going all in without a partner, without, with an extreme amount of support and coaching for myself, I was able to build a business in an aligned way that really supported a lifestyle while nurturing this mindset that I had of me being worth doing this on my own. Okay. Sure. It's quite a story, eh? Um, so in, your, in, your, in starting out your companies, right, you generally you need somewhat of an initial investment. What was that initial investment? Was it quite significant or compared to some other companies, was it 
you know, relatively uh, smaller. Well, we have to get specific on which company because the swimming company was zero. Well, like it was yeah, zero. The, cu- the, cur- the current one. I mean, I know you have five of them, but I guess the current yeah. ones, I guess you could maybe give like an average. Yeah. So I want you to know that you can start out with zero. Like you can, if you're trading services, you don't have to make an investment other than maybe the $50 that it takes. It depends on where you live, but to become a company, which I would strongly recommend because it allows you to take those expenses against your income. Um, and I probably invested like 250 or $400 in a lawyer to draft up the contracts. So investing in somebody due to do the books and a lawyer, you're talking about all in less than $1,000. And then okay. the space that we're sitting in right now is a co-working space that I had started. It's the only co-working space in the state of Virginia that has on-site childcare. And I sold this um, space. However, it's probably like 180 grand that was invested. So brick and mortar is always going to be more expensive Mm, because mm. you're paying for space prior to, and, and you've got to build it out. And you can work all of this into your like rental agreement, but whether or not you have customers, you've got to pay your payroll and your brick and mortar. Yeah, and yeah. so um, that's why I'm a huge fan of doing coaching and consulting and services where you just need a laptop. Like I have a really nice microphone, but you just need a laptop and a quiet space and your brain and your value. Um, and so I think on average, the three people that I would 100% invest in over and over and over again to support in starting a company is an accountant or CPA, um, which is a certified public accountant, um, a lawyer and a coach. Because why start your business at zero? Like it makes more sense to invest in somebody who can get you accelerated results. Like if you invest five grand in a coach in order to make 10 grand your first month, that's an incredible investment versus starting at zero and taking 10 months to make 10 grand. Yeah, hundred percent. And I'm assuming, I mean, I feel like this is even a silly question to ask you, but I'm assuming the returns on your investments have been way, way more than, than satisfying. What I will Not actually 100%. ask you though. <laughs> Not oh, really? 100%. No, no, I lost money on the co-working space. Oh really? Okay. I was going to, I was going to ask on, on top of that, I was going to ask, um, are you, are you comfortable to share what you lost? Uh, over 150. Okay. It's quite a knock. And on the other yeah. ones, you know, sometimes, well, often when we, when we go in with an investment, we have an expectation of when we hope to see a return on that investment on your other, besides the working space, cause that's obviously not a, not a win on the others. Did you, was it slower than expected? Somewhat what you expected, uh, much quicker. Yeah. So on our, on our coaching platform that we built, um, that was a lot slower because there was a huge learning curve in the tech space. And so again, investing in having somebody that knows that industry and knows that software, uh, at least like how to build that software has helped us stop the bleeding. There was a ton of cash that was going out because we didn't have the time or the energy to really learn. And so I wouldn't say, I'd say my batting average for owning companies is like 350. Um, okay. So, I mean, that's not a horrible batting average, but, you know, I'd love to be at like 400. That would be, feel much better. <laughs> and okay. no, no one wants to learn from a coach that's hit it out of the park every single time because then you don't know how to adjust and your failures and what to look out for. And so I think that what I've lost monetarily, I've gained in value and experience to be able to pass on to my team and my clients. And I don't necessarily work individually with clients anymore. And that's allowed me to build courses where people can access that knowledge 
for a much less of an investment, like a lower investment, um, you know, so that there's, there's really no barrier to entry. So, but yeah, I, I want to make sure that I'm not painting the picture of the fact that I have hit grand slams every single time because I have not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's like a common misconception. You know, I, I must be honest when you first said, oh, I have five companies and I've been started my first business when I'm 17, I immediately thought, Oh, every one of them was a success, like smashing it out of the park regardless. So yeah, that's just, it makes sense though. It makes sense. I guess, um, as you said, your mindset is that the losses actually just added to your experience, which you oh, can yeah. then pass on, which is, uh, yeah. somewhat invaluable, you know? Yeah. There's a, a real quick on that. There's, um, there's a sunken cost fallacy where it's like, I'm 180 grand into it. I'm 200 grand into it. Like I can't stop now because you know, then all the money is lost. And that wasn't the perception that I took. It was like, is this something that is accessing the most amount of value? And the other thing for me, and this is where you gotta get really clear on the lifestyle that you want and the values that you have. Even though it's an incredible concept and the person who owns it now is knocking it out of the park and has multiple locations, having a great idea doesn't mean that it's for you. Like there's a million great ideas that people have along their lifetime that they never bring to fruition. And so valuing my time freedom and my financial freedom wasn't aligned with owning a brick and mortar company. And it meant that I would hire somebody to run that brick and mortar company, which I have done in other companies, but I'd be putting in more time and more money in order to do that. And so I walked away from it and sold it knowing there's a sunken cost fallacy of, yeah. okay, well, I've sunk this cost, but how am I going to continue to dig the hole? Or am I going to go put my mind and energy over there? Mm, okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And obviously that would have been quite a tough challenge, you know, taking that loss. In life, we obviously going to face lots of challenges. Would you say that's one of the biggest ones you faced? Or is there something else that's, that comes to mind? Honestly, Calvin, because of being semi-seasoned business owner, I guess I'm more than a seasoned business owner at this point, taking yeah. those losses, it's like I knew immediately that if I focused my attention somewhere else that I could make up the revenue. And so that all those losses just meant is that I would have a lower tax burden at the end of the year. And the time and the energy, I'm not going to uh, be upset about that. I'm going to walk away with the lessons there. Mm. So was I upset about the losses? I think I was focused on the next step. And I think yeah. that that's something that as I do these interviews and as I work with clients, they're like, you're so pragmatic about how you look at business. When you own your first company, it's like your baby and you get emotional about it. When you're on your 15th, 14th company, like you are not your company. You know you're not your company. And I would sell or burn down or walk away from any of my companies right now, take a vacation, probably start a new one the next Monday because I know what I'm good at and my companies don't make me worthy or make me good. Like I'm the one who adds the value to them and to my clients. And so, you know, you just don't get lost in you're doing okay or you're not doing okay based on your bank account because the the actuality is I've made tons of money and I've lost tons of money and I can't take it with me but I can take the knowledge that I'm not dependent on my company for that that I'm actually the value maker in my life yeah yeah that's crazy yeah you more you worth more than what's what numbers in your bank account so I definitely agree with that. And in talking about the past, is there anything you, you can think of that you would change so far? You know, no. I guess you could put it any, any kind of regrets. The, the only regret, and I hazard to say like that there are any, right? Because if you go back and change something, who knows what impact it can yeah, have. Yeah, yeah, for sure. The only regret that I have is that I grew up playing softball and I totally idolized this coach named Mike Candrea. And this dude is amazing. And I actually went to university at University of Arizona um, 
and went to their volleyball team, even though I really wanted to play softball because Mike Candrea was the coach. And I got to go down to the softball field. I got to, you know, play with the coaches um, and the team. And they ended up having a severe amount of injuries in their spring season. And they needed people to step up and be on the team. And they asked. And I said no. And it was like this was my dream. And I said no because I lacked – I had a really bad experience with one of my coaches on the volleyball team. And I lost – confidence in myself. And so like I I literally walked away from sports because for a long time because I had just broken my spirit with this interaction. And so when they asked, I said no. Like I let that doubt that was already in me that that coach, you know, had kind of awoken <laughs> win and they went on to win the world championship that year so I would have a ring if I simply said yes and so is the regret in the fact that I didn't say yes kind of the regret is more so in the aspect that I let that coach get to me and win yeah that's crazy though Imagine, imagine you stuck around though and get that ring. But, but you know, it, as you said, we can't, we can't have regrets. I, I'm definitely of the same mindset. It gives me perspective, you know, and it's interesting because it's like, however many years later, like I, I'm not playing softball. I mean, I still love softball, but I'm not playing softball. You know, I'm a business owner. And so yeah. it gives me it gives me perspective to to when opportunities come about, even if it scares me to really take that moment and step up mm. to the plate. Yeah, for sure. OK. And in all of the 14, I think you said 14 companies, right, that you started. I think so. Have you ever sat back and felt like you've made it? You know, we all, you've probably heard the, the phrase of making it. Have you ever sat back and felt like you've made it? And if not... What do you think that would that would be or feel like for you to feel like you've made it? Yes, and I've hit every goal that I have set out for myself thus far. And I've sat there and looked at the bank account and been like, this is exactly what you wanted. And now what? <laughs> and so I've learned how to be super grateful for what I have and be okay with wanting more because the reality is I have retired I think twice at this point just like walked away and was like okay you know somebody else can run the companies I'll sell the companies I mean I was deep down having a conversation about selling my biggest company looking at beach houses all this kind of stuff and I ended up just being like but what would you do and the biggest thing that they wanted was um not it wasn't the biggest thing they wanted, but there was a non compete clause, and I didn't like the idea of somebody telling me what I could and couldn't do, and so it's like I took months with this where I wasn't working and looking at the beach houses and deciding what we're gonna do, and um ended up getting a, a huge check for something else that we had sold, not the company but um a private label option within the company, and what I realized was like. That, that doesn't make me happy. It makes me happy being in service and being a value. And I've talked to a lot of my clients and even family members that are looking forward to retirement. And I'm like, I feel like I have the best of both worlds right now. I can enjoy my life when I want to. And I still get to add the value and still get to feel like I have purpose. And so that's what I said about making, you know, piles of cash and losing piles of cash is like, What's actually your purpose? What's actually aligned? And my assumption is every day that I wake up, despite having, you know, my heart conditions and the disabilities that I'm dealing with, if I'm able to get out of bed and I'm able to come and do this podcast with you, like this is what I'm supposed to be doing, Mm. not sitting on a beach bored out of my mind. Like I I do a ton of sitting on the beach (laughs) and, you know, 
I also love doing this. And that's something that it's a conversation I've had with my husband. We're about to have our third kid. And it's a conversation I've had with my husband a lot lately is because I'm like, you know, we could we could just sell everything and walk away. And he's like, you've done that. You didn't Mm -hmm. like it. And so the biggest currency for me is the value exchange with other people, not what's in my bank account. Yeah, hundred percent. So obviously in deciding not to sell the company, you had somewhat of a vision for the company moving forward. Oh, companies, sorry. Uh, What would you say is next for your businesses? Do you have lots of big plans or is it kind of just keeping things the way they are now until you do one day decide to eventually sell, which I imagine would be the the goal one day, you know, down the line. Right now, the employees would take it over. So like we have an incredible ops manager who's my right and left hand. And in the event that something happens to me or in the event that I walk away, um, we execute and exercise what's called like an employee owned stock option um, plan. And so the company turns into stocks and is divided amongst the employees. So that would be the ultimate plan is that they do that. And we've been really, really successful in the corporate space and working with organizations, doing keynotes, doing workshops, doing trainings, private label courses, all of that. What I really wanted to focus on as of two years ago, and it really came to light during COVID, was helping entrepreneurs scale while not losing their sanity. And so we're turning about 18 to 20 percent of the company into an entrepreneurial focused coaching and consulting and making courses and tools. We've already made a program that makes coaching and business success not just attainable from a financial perspective, but really a no brainer. And so that's what I'm passionate about right now is bringing this to entrepreneurs to allow them to scale to their next six figures and seven figures so that they can ultimately be more successful financially and beyond than I am. Because that's that's the opportunity I'm giving is like, look, I've spent 20 years learning all this stuff longer if you count learning from my parents and my grandparents' company. You have no reason to start at zero. Take where I am and build off of it because I'm not going to be here forever. And so, you know, you build success for your family. You build legacy and generational wealth for your family. That's what I want to do. That is crazy. So with those, um, and forgive me if this is just my lack of, you know, I don't know, understanding of how these things work. With those employee stock options, does that essentially mean that you walk away like with like you don't get any money for the company they just take it over Uh, yeah i mean i could i could keep some of the stock if i wanted Uh to okay i probably won't it it's not a need you know i mean how cool is it going to be for them to wake up and realize that they own this thing that they have been so intricate in building like that's that's a perspective that i have i may own the company but I really don't. I can't do it without them. And so, yeah. you know, that company has given so much to me and to my family. And I'm so grateful for it. And that that comes from my team. And I'm really just so grateful for them. And so it's like if it was something where you own a company and you want to retire and you need 200 k a year in order to do that, then keep those stocks and turn the rest over to your employees if you want or sell your company for $2 million and then... You've got 10 years worth of that 200K. Um, but if you don't, why? Yeah. Yeah, you, I, I guess uh, I filmed with a, a guest a while ago and he said, if you get all hung up on, oh, it's my company and these are my shares, at the end of the day, you actually just end up with nothing. You know, you just, it's, some, it's like tied into greed, right? And I think it's, it's hard to have that perception or that mindset when, when it is your company. And I kind of understand why it's hard to have that mindset, you know. If it's my company, it would feel a bit weird giving it, not giving it away. Obviously, you, you get passing it on to people who've worked for you and put in, they've built the company with you in a sense. So it does actually yeah. make sense. It is difficult. Yeah. And so 
in thinking about this question, I know that there are some ways that I can think of, you know, taking some time off, relaxing on the beach. But f from you, what would you say are some of the best ways to avoid burnout without having to take a three week vacation? Because that's not always possible, you know? Yeah, it's not really going to work because you're going to go into the three week vacation thinking about all the things you've got to accomplish in order to take the three weeks off. And then are you really going to let yourself relax? Um, so I think a time audit is really valuable. I, uh, my belief is that things are 70% energy, 30% strategy. So a time audit gives you some clarity and awareness on where you're spending your time. And then I use something called the Pareto principle and I identify what 20% am I doing that's leading to 80% of my results? And how can I reduce the 80% that's on my calendar? And I also look at what I can automate, delegate, outsource, and eliminate. You don't have to do everything that's on your calendar. That's just something you're telling yourself. And this is something that I work deeply with my clients on. And boundaries. Boundaries on your time, boundaries on your energy, boundaries on your money. If, if you don't have them, then, you know, you're, you're essentially not being very efficient with everything that you're making. And so I could tell you all of this stuff and you could get back all of this energy, but then just allow other people to take it from you. And so mm. the, the biggest thing that I would do to avoid burnout is to go a solid hour and a half, two hours in the morning before you touch your phone. You will sure. change your set point for stress because when you wake up and the first thing you do is jump into your phone, you're letting your phone dictate how you're going to feel and what your thoughts are going to be for the rest of the day. You know what? It's actually so funny you say that. I shit you not. This week, mm -hmm. so I've been, I used to do that and then I got in, slip into the habit of going on my phone and this week, uh, what are we, Thursday, Monday, Wednesday, whatever. On Monday, I did that. I made sure I didn't turn my, I turned my phone on airplane mode when I go to bed. So I didn't turn it off until I, I think, got to work or wherever I was, like an hour and a half, two hours later. And I've been feeling like, I don't know, just like mental clarity. It's, yeah. it's very, it's very like, you can feel it. It's tangible. Yeah. It's very easy to, to feel the difference. It's crazy. Yeah. I've um, had my phone on silent since December and we're recording this <laughs> in September. What? Okay. That's, that's elite level though. That's like expert stuff. Um, yeah. But then think about it. Like I pick up my phone and decide to do something with it. My phone's never prompting me to do something. Yeah. Yeah. It's the best way to live actually. Um, okay. And then lastly, so what is one message you would give to a young entrepreneur? You know, maybe you can think of it as a success nugget that you've held onto that you can pass on to them. Yeah. I think this is just for entrepreneurs and humans in general. Yeah. I love the quote from Dr. Seuss in the Lorax that says, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's ever going to get better. It's not. And I would add that unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot about yourself, like you cannot pour from an empty cup. And so start with you and care a lot about yourself and that will come out in your processes, that will come out in the people that you work with, in your clients, in your team, and that will come out in your profits as well. Because you're starting with the most highest ROI there is, which is you. Yeah, investing in yourself. Okay, mm -hmm. and just, just before we sign off, just a quick one, is there, uh, now's your chance to give your business a bit of a shameless plug. I know you have a few of them, but is there maybe a website or somewhere where people can, or the listeners can find you and your business? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to give you guys homework if you want to get started. Um, they go to a better place, consulting.com forward slash unstuck, and you can get 30 days of coaching right in your inbox from me. And if you use the code READY, R-E-A-D-Y, it'll give you a massive discount so that you can just have no excuse starting line here. And I'd love, the best way, place to connect with me is on Instagram, at the Bunny Young. And other than that, you know, find the YouTube channels, find, all the links are on Instagram. And there's really so many options for us to connect and continue this conversation. And I'm just here in full support for your success. 
Awesome. I'll also put all the links in the description and all of those beautiful things. But Perfect. But thank, thank you so much for your time, Bunny. I really appreciate it. All right. Awesome. Thank you for having me. I'll talk to you soon. What is up, you absolute weapons? Thank you for watching and listening to None of Your Business. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you want to follow us on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and all of those beautiful places, you can find the links in the description below. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Until next time.